Three years ago, I built a root cellar in our basement, and it worked incredibly well for us the first year, the second year, and now we're in year three. I thought I'd do a third year review of how this has worked for us. So stick around. This is an 8 foot by 12 foot by 8 foot space that cost $20 to build. I'll explain. We're on the outside here, and one thing I'd like to say before we get too much further along is this is going to be a really no frills tour. It is ragged and has some coarse edges here or there. I know there are examples out on YouTube that you can look up of really elegant, beautiful, costly root cellars. I thought it'd be nice for folks to see one that is done in a very simple way, and you can make it as fancy as you want from there. These are foam board insulation panels. You'll say, well, wait a minute, 20 bucks. Well, I found a fellow who was uh, a carpenter, and he was helping to take apart an old building, and so they reclaimed all of these foam panels, and I traded him these panels for trees. But even if I were to buy them all for even $200, this would be well worthwhile. But at $20 uh, in screws and some pieces of wood, the panels and some tape, um, at 768 cubic feet, so it's 12 feet in this dimension, we are in the northeast corner of our home here. And it's 8 feet in this dimension. And you'll see in a moment on the inside, there are two windows that go to the outside world that allow the cold air to come into this space. But at 768 cubic feet for $20, I think it's two cents a cubic foot for a, w a refrigerator that is always on in the winter and never fails even if the power goes out. So I'm very happy with that. You can see that, well, early on I had intentions of improving or making a latch for the door. I just put this piece of wood there. This was a few years ago. We realized, you know what, that's fine enough. Never really upgraded that and it's never really needed. The gasket to keep the air in is a piece of heavy duty duct tape folded over and that has worked for a couple of years. Uh, so I never went any fancier with getting rubber gasketing or anything like that because this has simply kept the air in good enough. And the structure that holds these foam board pieces are off cuts of wood. Let's see. You can see some, these are uh, off cuts of hemlock that I got very low cost that are screwed into the joists of the floor above with some simple screws. They're more or less almost hanging in this space. They're not structurally very sound. The foam board is then lightly screwed into them. So it just creates a lightweight framework to hold the foam board up. Wherever there are gaps, we use duct tape and a little bit of spray foam, no big deal. And then made these pallet shelves for our potatoes. Now we're in later February, so we're coming into the home stretch of winter storage, but there's still some really beautiful potatoes. The last couple years, this space has held potatoes for us no problem all the way to spring. Most of these are rock hard, so Sasha will go through and use the ones that are getting softer first. And when we load this in the fall, we load the nicest looking, most sound potatoes in the back, the hardest to reach area, with the idea that those will probably get us all the way to spring and then we can replant whatever we don't eat. We've given a lot of potatoes away, we cook with them extensively, and we certainly will not run out of potatoes this winter in the space. While I'm here, it's worth noting, there is our temperature, it ranged between 34 and 37 degrees over the last day. It was 10 degrees last night outside. And the way I regulate the temperature, it's held between 34 and 37, maybe 39 this whole winter, which is perfect temperature for us. A little low on humidity, but we can keep the humidity high around certain crops, and I'll explain that in a moment. The way that this gets its cold air is simply one tube here, Now, in this case this was a leftover piece of four inch drainage tube, nothing fancy there, and the on off switch is that piece of plastic. Right now ice cold air is rushing over my hand. I've learned that if it's below 15 degrees out Fahrenheit 
that we need to turn this off or at least turn it down. And again, that's as fancy as it's had to be for the last couple years. You can say what you want as far as aesthetics and quality and all that, but it has worked. We've been able to store food in here all winter for a few years with absolutely no electricity with that one tube. One upgrade, simple upgrade that was made this year is, <laughs> well, again, it is what it is. This metal duct tube was connected to that tube. Now this goes up through the floorboard and right into the back of our wood stove. And that's how the wood stove gets its breathing air to combust. I talk about that in our wood stove video, which I'll link to. Someone recommended, why not cut that? So rather than having direct ice cold air come in to your wood stove and instead have it dump down into your root cellar and then the wood stove can breathe the air at the top of the root cellar. So now there's ice cold air pouring in. And in this case, it's dumping right over these apples. We bought some organic apples from friends in November. And in mid-February, they're still, I mean, they're starting to shrivel a little bit. But for absolutely no electricity, we still are able to eat apples pretty much every day, which is lovely. Got some garlic down in here that's holding just fine. And so we have two ports where ice cold air from the outside is sliding in 24 seven and one port at the top that's sucking the, the stale air out of the space. You can see we've used a lot of what's been in here. This is, I get, I, in fairness, I should include the price of this rack. I spent $60 on this rack, but I certainly could have made that out of pallets. Um, so that would bump up the price. It could also just be a stack of milk crates, <laughs> but we like having this rack. It's underutilized right now, but there's a whole lot of storage. Now this is like long-term refrigeration storage for material that Sasha's made. So there's rendered lard, there's incredibly strong hot sauce, there's homemade misos, there's vinegar preserved garlics, there's really nice lacto ferment hot sauces and preserved sweet peppers and olive oil, um, some pestos, and there's room for twice if not three times that on these racks. So we're actually really underutilizing how much space is available in this uh, almost 800 cubic foot completely passive electric grid-free refrigerator. So that's exciting, we could scale up. Uh, on the east side here, these tubs are storing seeds for my nursery. And you can see, well, here we keep the humidity higher. So we've got a bag full of salad greens we recently got in a bag that'll keep the humidity up. This will be good for almost a week, even more down here. These carrots we bought in November, they're still just fine. And we traded with my friend Eric for some beautiful onions back in October, and these are rock solid. Once a month, we'll go through and feel them. Any that are softening will come to the very top, and we'll try to prioritize using those first. Very, very low tech, really resilient food storage. We have enough food to get through a pretty long spell of needing food without refrigeration down here, and I don't see any reason why this can't just passively continue to work for decades. I just pulled out one of these tubs. In this case, it's chestnut. And these have been stored in moist sawdust. I haven't actually added water to this this whole winter. And I can see it's just warm enough in here that these are beginning to wake up. So hopefully they won't grow much further. And the idea of, I've stored chestnuts uh, in other areas for the nursery, the idea was to be able to have these all winter to enjoy for roasting. And some of them are still in great shape. They're very, very moist and full bodied. So we can cut these and put these on the wood stove to eat them. Um, and then the ones that are sprouting, I can plant. That's they're moving along. This is the first season I've stored chestnuts down here. And so now I've learned that by mid February, if we wanted to eat them, we probably should have gotten on with it and eaten them. But 
a lot of them may have sprouted just a little bit and then they may sit here and wait for it to warm up a little bit. This tub has a few different things happening. The bulk of this is all hazelnut and these are all for seed. So I'll be planting these in the spring into air prune beds, which I'll document, but these are holding and staying dormant really nicely. They're fully asleep and fully moist and firm. They're going to be beautiful seeds. We've got probably a thousand future hazelnut plants in this one tub passively resting in our root cellar. Some dwarf sour cherries, well, they're woken up a little further than I'd like, but I'll still try to plant them on this spring. But that's not ideal. I'm learning this family, the prunus and malus, stored moist over winter in cool but not very cold. They're going to wake up too early. So these are some prune plums that are certainly moving on. But that's for another video. Learning as I go. Some are sprouting early, but we'll still plant them and just have to be a little bit more careful. But right now, down here, I would venture a guess amongst all of these tubs are five to 10,000 trees waiting to grow. So that's a very exciting situation. You can see all these are seedling pawpaws and we've got a Mioga ginger that's marginally hardy in our area that's being stored over winter and a little mouse trap because this is a valuable tub. <laughs> Just in case. Mice once in a while will come in here, but with our cat Stanley, uh, once a week or so, we'll open the door for an hour and let him come in and frolic, and he takes care of whatever mice are in here. So that gives an idea of what's happening this winter in our passive root cellar. My hope with this video is that, uh, just like with a lot of the videos, that you see an example of a low, very low cost not necessarily exquisitely executed, but effective and appropriate technology-driven solution for decoupling a need for electricity and fossil fuels in order to store food, grow food, all the nice things for you and your family. I can't recommend it enough. If you have a uh, basement, ideally with a concrete floor or a bare earth floor, strongly recommend considering framing out a simple space in a corner. Northeast is ideal, and ideally with windows, and these are boxed off and insulated. Very simple, passive, there's no fans needed to make the cold air come in. If you don't have a wood stove in a corner to draw air up, so that vacuuming there is nice in our space, if you didn't have that, you could do a very simple framing job where the top of your root cellar, you can see there's a gap up there. That was my original design and it allowed hot air to sneak out of the space because you do want a little bit of airflow. But you can always adjust. If you get mold or too high of a humidity, make adjustments. But anyway, that's our root cellar a few years in, performing incredibly well and poised just to just continue to operate every winter with no problems. Please ask some questions in the comments, share some ideas, and thank you so much for watching.